inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to visit Cambridge as always. And I think this is the first time in this lab. And I've noticed you've got bean bags, which mean that I want to work here already. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Gareth and I'm based over in London at Queen Mary. And today I want to talk to you about a paper that we recently published at IMC, looking at some of the challenges faced in the decentralized web. Now I should kick off by saying that this was not a sole effort. I had some fantastic collaborators. I think one of whom you probably recognise, the, the handsome one in the corner, Lindsay Saga. Uh, but also this work was done alongside Aravind, Timiliano and Nishant, who some of you may know. So, by the end of today, what I hope I have convinced you of is that it's damn hard to go ahead and try and decentralise the web. Now, I am not the first person to make this comment. Anybody recognise this chap? Of course you do. So this is Alexis de Tocqueville. He was a French philosopher and historian. And he said about 150 years ago, a push towards decentralization in the end simply became an extension of centralization. Anybody know what he was talking about? Of course, it was the French Revolution. Very bloody time in French history where the people of France made a valiant attempt to decentralize the head of Louis XVI from the rest of his body. And in many ways, this is not dissimilar to how the web works, because if you were to fast forward 20 years, what you'd realize is that the state had re-centralized again around the personality, of course, Napoleon Bonaparte. So let's bring this back into the technological world and think about how the web worked 20 years ago. So if you were to look at the infrastructure and the usage of the web back then, what you'd find is a system very similar to this, where you've got lots of web servers running different types of services and sites. And each of these individual services were accumulating distinct user groups. And now, this was a really nice way to run things for many different reasons. For example, you had much more symmetrical power structures. The uh, powers of these were not so disproportionate to the powers of these. Uh, it was more resilient, so for example, if, let's say, MySpace chooses to shut down tomorrow, it doesn't take down the whole system because many other users and many other services still exist. And of course, because of this, it had no central point of failure. You know, if one of these servers go down, it doesn't affect the other ones. And last but not least, for those people concerned about privacy in the world, it had superior privacy properties because you didn't just have this one or two large organizations owning all of the data. Instead, it was split up and segregated across many different stakeholders. Now, if we fast forward today, the picture is very, very dissimilar, where you have a few major organizations, mostly US organizations, who accumulate users and data from pretty much everyone. Now, it's very fashionable at the moment to bemoan this model. But we also have to accept that there are many good things about this setup. So it's really cool that you have this critical mass of users whereby I can get on a plane and fly to Mexico, and if I make a friend there, there's a good chance I can add them on Facebook because we all are centralized around this one service. You can also do some really cool orchestrated deployments where we pay engineers lots of money to think incredibly cleverly about how they should get those services out there to offer a great experience in a very scalable and reliable manner. And of course, because you have these large economies of scale, these organizations have the resources to pump in to the system to make sure that we're constantly satisfied and constantly engaging with the system. So I suppose the question that many people in the decentralized web community want to ask is, actually, how can we go about trying to get the best of both worlds? Now, I don't know if you've been following politics, but um, they're not the first people to ask this question. We've been doing an experiment in the UK. And what we found is it's actually pretty difficult to get the best of both worlds. And what I want to do for the rest of this talk is talk a little bit about some of these difficulties and these challenges, specifically within the context of the decentralized web. Now, the decentralized web as a concept essentially boils down to a bunch of very interesting open source implementations of services that we all know and love such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, but offered in an entirely decentralized way. So for example, this is Peertube. Uh, this platform gives you a decentralized version of YouTube. Uh, this one over here is called Mastodon. That's what we're talking about today. And it gives you essentially a decentralized version of Twitter. So before I continue, let's 
dive into actually how these decentralized versions work. So let's imagine we wanted to set up a Mastodon service. So this is, remember, a decentralized microblogging service like Twitter. So the first thing we'd need to do is get ourselves a server. Okay? Maybe that's a virtual machine or maybe a bare metal server, but we purchase one of those and we then install the Mastodon software onto it. And this is basically a full web stack. Right? So you install this and anybody can connect <coughs> to it. And what you have is a little mini version of Twitter just on this one individual server. And of course, other people could do this as well. So perhaps here in Bell Labs, we set up a server. Uh, maybe someone in Queen Mary sets up a server. And maybe somebody working in a company elsewhere in the world sets up their own server. And of course, each of these services can accumulate their own distinct set of users. So for example, for the Bell Labs one, maybe I give you all the domain name and you log on and you create accounts. And of course, you can all communicate. You can all microblog and read each other and follow each other's posts. But there's a problem here, isn't there? because we've now got these three completely independent communities who are not talking to each other, which in a global world doesn't really make sense. So for example, if uh, Daniele over here wanted to, yeah, it took me a long time to Photoshop this, by the way. <laughs> Daniele over here wanted to follow maybe John based on uh, another service. How could they do that? Well, Mastodon thought of this, and what they introduced is this idea of a remote follow operation where one user on another service can remotely follow another. And what this actually results in is a federated link being created between the servers such that if John posts a message tomorrow, it will automatically be pulled across onto Daniele's service so it can be presented on his timeline. And of course, as you scale the system up and more users come in, you'll see that these federated links occur between lots of different servers. And content is constantly being pulled across to create, essentially, a globalized, integrated network on top of a decentralized infrastructure. How do you discover the peers? So it works in a way that's not entirely dissimilar to email. So basically, Daniele's name would be associated with the domain of this server. So if, for example, John wanted to follow him, he'd obviously put in the full canonical name of... Um, so there is, a, there is an agreement between those uh, server providers that, that would be the domain of the decentralized should be existing. So there's no sort of single structure to how it's done, uh, but indeed each of these servers will have their own domain. And the way it's typically um, done that John might discover Daniele's name is, well, obviously you could perhaps give it on the business card, that's one way, but actually more common is that you have existing relationships between these servers. And actually when you log into a Mastodon instance, it has something called a federated timeline which shows all of the um, posts that are being pulled from others. So for example, if you see somebody on there, you can just click and follow them. So that is a much more straightforward way to discover people based on other servers. Does that make sense, roughly? Yes, um, it makes sense. Uh, so I have a couple of follow-up questions. Please. Uh, so, if, uh, so I understand that this, in this particular case that Daniela's entire data would be sort of like a uh, placed into this particular instance of the server. Mm -hmm. So what happens when Daniele and John is interacting with each other? Where the data goes? Very good question. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but to give you a, a quick answer, what will happen is it will get pulled across and cached on the other server, such that when Daniele logs in, basically it's, it's there for him. But we will actually talk at length in a, in a few slides about that. Uh, if I don't answer the question later on, feel free to raise it again. OK, so at this point, what you might say is fantastic news. Great. It sounds like we've decentralized. We've got this globally integrated social network that sits on a nicely decentralized architecture. Now, the only problem is all the Lexus de Tocqueville keeps coming in from the side and saying, no, you've not. Because even though you've built actually a very elegant decentralized architecture, that does not necessarily mean it will be deployed and operated in a decentralized manner, because in many cases, cases, there are these pressures that push you back towards a centralized model. And I'm sure some of you know these already, but what I'm going to do is for the rest of the session, tell you about some of the analysis we've been doing with about 18 months of measurement data we collected from the Mastodon platform. So what we did is we started connecting to about 4,000 servers. 
And in Mastodon terminology, we refer to these as instances. And for each of these servers, we started collecting the tweets that people were posting there. And in Mastodon terminology, we refer to tweets as an incredibly cute thing called toots. Mm -hmm. So apologies if I start using terminology you've not come across before. And the idea that I want to study here is what pressures exist that are pushing this service back towards a more central model. Now, as I said, we were collecting this data for about 18 months, so we had quite a substantial time shot of how much we were seeing. And what we found was a rapidly growing system. There were a lot of users coming on board, there were a lot of new communities being set up, and there was actually a lot of excitement and buzz around the platform. If you went onto Google, you'd be able to find lots and lots of interesting tech articles talking about the decentralized web. But the way I want to present the results to you is to go through a thought experiment. Because remember, many of the decisions being made in this platform are human decisions. People like you or I are making these decisions because it's a decentralized service. So instead of presenting a bunch of results to you, instead let's go through the thought process and ask ourselves a few questions. So imagine we wanted to set up our own Bell Labs instant tomorrow. What are we going to do? Where are we going to host our server? Well, we don't need to hypothesize about this. We uh, collected those 4,000 instances and we looked at where they were hosted. And what we found is the following. So first of all, I'm going to just highlight this colouring to you. Uh, it's going to be used consistently across all the other graphs. So the blue bar counts instances, the green counts toots, remember those are tweets, and the red bar obviously counts users. And what you see in this graph, this is just showing the top five web hosting providers, is that the majority of users, about half of them, were entirely reliant on just three network providers. And in fact, two-thirds of all the toot content being generated was being hosted on just these three networks. So because of this, you might question to what extent this is truly decentralized. Because if, for instance, one of these players decided tomorrow that it was against their terms and conditions to host Mastodon instances, then a significant portion of the system would go down overnight. So let me throw another question to you now. Imagine you're not setting up one of these instances. Imagine instead you wanted to join Mastodon. Now when you join in Mastodon, because this is an instance base, you obviously need to decide which instance you're going to join. You don't have that decision in something like Twitter. You just go to the Twitter front end and you join it. But in Mastodon, you need to pick an individual server. So which one are you going to join? Exactly. You're not going to be a billion obates and join one with two users, are you? <laughs> so what you find is that 90% of the users we're seeing are just joining the top 5% of servers. And those top 5% of servers are hosting and storing 95% of all the content. And of course, there's a network effect here because larger servers with more users are more attractive for other people to come and join. But one of the interesting things that we saw is that you also get the impact of the topic covered within those servers. Because what often happens is individual instances are set up with a particular remit. So for example, if we set one up here in Bell Labs, it's likely to be about technology. And again, what we're seeing here is along the x-axis, category tags for the different instances. And what you unsurprisingly see is that over half of the servers set up are themed around technology, like Linux, for example. Makes sense? This is still a bit of a kind of a techie focused domain, so it's not surprising that you see so many servers being set up themed around technology. But there's an elephant in the room here, isn't there? Because what we see is that the servers that are set up around a topic do not necessarily accumulate proportional number of users. So for example, over half of the servers are themed around technology, but they only accumulate about a fifth of all the users. And over here you see this outlier, this red bar. Well, that is, sorry. Actually, can you turn the camera off for a second? <laughs> we, 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 okay. <laughs> what you see is that a large portion, almost 60% of the users, are magnating towards these adult content instances. So even though the administrators who are setting it up are much more excited and interested in talking about things like tech and games, to the broader user population, they have alternative interests. So instances are not on the market, so they're not aligned with the demand. So that's, yeah, that's one way of framing it, yeah. Yeah, 
Okay, right. So we've seen that there are some pressures that are being put on the system that push it towards a slightly more centralized model. But you might be saying to me, well, okay, okay, yeah. Um, how, uh, so this content providers in the same senses are not completely isolated, right? No. So actually because of the federation, you can have people pulling content across. So right. you, know, you might set yourself up a tech instance and join that, but that doesn't stop you from subscribing to users that are associated with other instances. Just, just you know, for, a, for a purely phonological sense, this is not really decentralized, completely decentralized system. It's sort of like a centralized, decentralized system that you are trying to create a sort of like sub-network of your... Y yeah, uh, you, you could look at it like that. So, I mean, a, a nice analogy is looking back to the world of peer-to-peer -peer exactly. back in the day, and you had similar properties there. And of course, these emerge for lots of different reasons. Um, one reason it emerges here is because actually it's kind of nice to have that decentralized, centralized point of control because I can set up an instance tomorrow and I can have control over that instance and I can set the policy on that instance. You know, I'm, I know, but I think that the systems like this, for example, the hackers group has always been decentralized, right? They always have their own instances and they do actually mm -hmm. have instant messaging and emailing all managed by their own yep. uh, in a sort of like a private network. Yep. Right? So what I'm trying to say is that um, what this basically uh, confirms is that this decentralization not necessarily is going to push us into a completely different model. It will just recreate a different flavor of yeah. what we already have today. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, and indeed, like, in, in many ways, this is not dissimilar from people running their own email servers, which you know used to happen a lot, less so now, but you know, it was only, I think, five or six years ago that Queen Mary was running its own email infrastructure, which in a sense is similar to what's happening here. Okay, so now let's move a little bit on because you might be saying to me that obviously these user patterns, these network effects occur, we know that, but at least having a decentralized architecture gives us reliability. Not quite. So, to look at this problem, what we started to do to complement that user data I was mentioning before was to also connect to each of those servers every five minutes. So every five minutes we connected to every single server and we recorded whether or not it was online. And of course the idea was to see actually how much uptime do these servers have. If I subscribe to one, is it going to be still alive tomorrow? And what we found was that about a tenth of all the servers that we were monitoring were inaccessible for half of the time. And incidentally, when I say half of the time, I do not mean they were available for the first half of the measurement period, then they went offline. It wasn't like that. Instead, it was up and down, up and down. There was a non-deterministic pattern to it, such that you never knew whether or not your server, if it was in this portion of them, would be alive the day after tomorrow. So an obvious hypothesis to check here was that maybe the unpopular servers with few users were the ones that went down. So this is obviously a box plot, and what we've done is we've binned the servers based on the number of toots on that server. And you know what we see is fairly intuitive. These servers with small number of toots below 10k have much, much wider spans of downtime. Okay, makes perfect sense. Whereas if you start to take a look at those with over a million toots on them, they have much better availability properties. But the interesting thing from this graph is actually the outliers. The fact that even these servers that have managed to accumulate over a million posts still have cases where unavailability is exceeding 10 or 20 percent. And in fact, we only found 5 percent of the servers to have nearly 100 percent uptime. It was instead very common for these services to come and go. And by the way, this is not a criticism of the system, right? The nature of this system is that it's mostly voluntary, right? So a lot of people are putting a lot of cycles for free. So please don't take this as a criticism of the system. In many ways, it's remarkable that they've managed to keep such good uptime when they're often working on a shoestring budget. But the reason, of course, this happens is, amongst other things, it still has those central dependencies. So I mentioned at the beginning that in many cases, people were hosting their servers on a small number of ASs. Well, what we found is that across our measurement period, we had six cases of entire network outages where the entire hosting provider went down. And obviously when that occurs, all of them disappear in one sudden go, all the servers disappear. 
We also had another interesting case where we were finding issues with certificate authorities. So certificate authorities are, by definition, a centralised concept. Right? You have trust anchors that you rely on and you receive endorsements from. When one of those goes down or one of those revokes your certificate, it's going to have serious ramifications. So we found that 85% of the servers were using just one certificate authority. And this is just a, a nice example we, we spotted here. So can anybody guess what happened here? So, so just to explain, this is showing the number of unavailable instances. What we see here is a huge spike where about 100 instances suddenly go offline. Why? Because they're all using one certificate authority which expired on the same day. And when it expired, all of those servers became inaccessible because you got TLS errors. And then you see, of course, some people recognize that and they started to fix the problem. But the standard expiry date is a TTL of three months. So three months later, those people that had uh, managed to fix it forgot again and phew, it spiked back up again. So again, this is another challenge when dealing with the centralized components in the system, which often go unnoticed. Nobody thinks about certificate authorities as being a centralized component to worry about, but indeed, they can have a major impact on your system. And it's almost impossible to get away from them because for sure your web browser is relying on them and you need to use them. Now, the last part I want to do is to move back onto you guys again. Because frankly, you people make this much, much harder. Because you people, and by the way, I include myself in that, have very common behavioral properties which make it incredibly difficult to decentralize. So you've set up your account, you're on your instance, you're having a great time, who are you going to follow? You're going to follow the popular people. Exactly. You're going to follow the Trumps of the world or the Obamas of the world. So the top 5% of users in the system accumulate the vast, vast majority of followers. Okay? So 80% of the people have fewer than 10 followers. So they're not very powerful or influential in the system. So that might be poor old Mr. Pigeon down here with five followers, where you've got good old Mr. Grumpy Cat up there with a million or 10 million followers. Now, you might say, well, we've seen this a thousand times before in most social networks, makes sense. But the difference here is that what happens if Mr. Grumpy Cat's server goes offline? Because that's a very real possibility in a decentralized setup. So what happens if the powerful user's servers suddenly disappear? And this is actually much more complicated than it initially looks. So let's take a quick example. Imagine you've got a few servers set up. So we've got four Mastodon servers in three different hosting providers. Uh, OVH, that's a, a French web host, uh, Amazon's EC2, and perhaps a virtual machine running at my home university. And of course, each one of these servers have got their own users attached. They've got their own users who have created accounts there. Okay. Now what this means is, because of federation, users could choose to follow across the platform, but if they do, that creates these federated links which actually pull the content across, such that I know if this user wanted to receive an item of content from that user, obviously it would have to be reposted across the social graph and that would result in it being pulled through this federated graph underneath. Okay, makes sense. So obviously you'd quite literally have TCP connections going between these servers pulling the content. Okay. But obviously this is not a realistic social graph. It typically looks something more like this, where you might have a few very popular users with lots of friends. Uh, you might have people like me who've got very few users as friends. And you might have people like this who are bridges, kind of bringing together different communities. Now, the problem is, what happens if maybe there's a network partition? So this internet between these two networks goes down. Well, naturally what happens is when the federated underlying link breaks, the social links break as well. And of course, this can have transitive effects across the network such that users over here who have never even heard of people over here cease receiving their content because there's nobody to hop it along. And this is actually a really big problem because in most cases, instances rely heavily on foreign content to be imported into them. So what this graph here shows is the percentage of content on the server that's been locally produced versus remotely produced. So what you can see here is that about 
10% of the, um, the servers have the vast majority of content produced locally. These are the biggest servers with lots of users on. But the rest of these servers here have actually very small amounts of local content, and instead what they're doing is they're pulling content remotely from federated links. So if one of those social graph ties falls down, it can have a really major effect on these users who import most of their content. So what we thought we could do is try to test this. So we took the social graph information that we've been collecting within that measurement cycle I discussed earlier, and we recreated the social graph. And what we then did is we started removing servers to see what impact it would have. So this graph gives you uh, just one of the results. We actually had lots of different results looking at lots of different perspectives. I redirect you to the paper if you're interested. So what this shows here is what happens when we remove servers. And this solid line here is showing the size of the largest connected component in the social graph. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but what you see is this rapid decay whereby when you remove servers, the number of, uh, sorry, the size of the largest connected component rapidly decays. You know, removing just the top 1% of user accounts decreases the connected component to about a quarter of all the accounts. And that was from, I think, about 90% of all the accounts before we started removing them. It gets even worse when you start to fail entire networks. Remember, I told you that we were observing entire network outages. When they happen, it has a dramatic effect on the social graph because you're removing multiple servers. So for example, if you remove the top five web hosts, the uh, autonomous systems, that's what that means, what you find is you just shatter the entire social graph into hundreds of pieces and people can't speak to each other anymore. And the same thing happens with the content. So again, it's the same setup here. We're removing servers, sorry, we're removing networks and servers one by one. And this is showing the percentage of toots that are still live in the system. And what you see is that you only need to remove a few networks for the number of toots in the system to drop completely. So what we thought we could do is try to build some replication schemes to make this a less severe problem. And indeed, some variants of this already exist in the open source implementation. So the first one we tried was what's called subscription-based replication. So the idea is that if you have a user on your server that follows a remote user, whenever that remote user posts, you're going to grab it and store persistently a copy on your local machine. And that's going to be indexed such that other people can discover it. And what we can see here is that instead of getting this rapid decay where all of the toots become unavailable, you see it's much more shallow. Okay? It's much more shallow because those replicas, even when a server goes down, are remaining in the network. But what's most noticeable is even though they, it's more shallow, it's still not 100% availability. In fact, after removing just 20 networks, you're getting about 20% of the content unavailable. Now imagine that. You're accessing Twitter, and a fifth of all the stuff you wanted to see was not available. You probably wouldn't be happy. So what we did then was experiment with some other techniques. And one of the th techniques we experimented was random replication. Now, the reason we did this is because when you do the subscription-based replication, the replication is embedded in the social graph. And that social graph often comes with certain biases. So maybe if you speak Japanese, it's much more likely that you're going to be following a user on another Japanese-speaking server. And because there is a distinct set of web hosts in Japan, there's an increased probability that you're going to be accessing two servers hosted on the same provider, like Sakura. So what we decided to do is try random replication, where whenever a user creates an item of content, it randomly gets copied onto one or more other servers. So just to remind you, this is what happens without any replication whatsoever, with a dramatic decay. This is what happens when we do subscription-based replication. You know, it's much better, but we're still losing about 20% of the content. But when we do the re random replication, we get over 99% availability, because the random replication detaches it from the social biases embedded in the graph. Key take-home messages I want to impart to everybody here is that a decentralized architecture does not necessarily mean decentralized usage or decentralized deployments. And there are some interesting challenges to tackle there in the future. And last but not least, I think that measurement-informed work is a very valid way to spend our day, and it's damn hard to decentralize the web.
Thank you for your time.